race, and we will finish our race strong, Lord God. So, Father, we thank you, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, so before I get started, I want to see how many men do we have in the house? Do we have any? Come on, cheer, come on. What about the ladies? It sounded like there was more power from the ladies than the men. I don't know. <laughs> Can I hear that again? Come on, where are the men? I like the cheering over here, you know. <laughs> that was Mikey? <laughs> How about the ladies? All right. I can tell you today we're balanced out, but sometimes we only have ladies in the house. <laughs> so today's um, topic is called, Where Are the Men? Huh? Mm, where are the men? Where are those men? Those mighty warriors of God, you know? Where are those men that will stand up to whatever comes their way and understand their place in the kingdom, their place in their families, and also their place in the church? Because for some reason, God has called the men to be what? Not only head of the household, right? But also to lead ministries, lead churches, to make decisions on behalf of a congregation or maybe a people's, right? So that's why I'm asking, where are the men? So let's open our Bibles. And we're going to start with 1 Timothy 2. And I want you to understand this, that every man of God and every person, whether, again, women or men, but in this case I'm referring to the men in particularly, we must understand that God has given us a responsibility. And the responsibility will be, you know, we will have to be, you know, accounted for, accounted for that. And we have to give account, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I just lost my word here. Accountability for all that. This is like this. First Timothy 2 says, first of all, then I urge you that petitions, specific requests, prayers, intercessions, prayers for others, and thanksgiving be offered on behalf of all people. For kings and all who are in positions of high authority, so that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all good godliness and dignity. So it's saying that we must present what? Our prayers, our requests, our petitions. For what purpose? For what purpose? Why, why does God want us to bring our petitions forward and our prayer requests so we can do what? We can have a life of what? Yes. How many want to live a life of peace? Yes. You don't want peace? You don't like peace? If you don't have peace, maybe it's because maybe we're not doing the first part. If we're not living in a peaceful country, or in this case, in our society, maybe we're not able to have peace. Maybe we're not doing the first part and having our, our prayers being answered. Okay? Let's keep going. It says, this kind of praying is good and acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who wishes all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge and recognition of the divine truth. So not only God wants to save everyone, but he wants everyone to be saved, sorry, and to come to the knowledge of who he is. And I want you to understand that. It says, for there is only one God and only one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom, as a substitutionary uh, sacrifice to atone for all the testimony given at the right and proper time, and for this matter, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying when I say this. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Therefore, I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing or quarreling or doubt in their mind. I only heard one amen. <laughs> And it came from a woman. I want to read that last verse. Number seven. No, actually, number eight says, Therefore, I want the men. Who? Men. The men. Not the ladies. The men. Where are the men? Right here. Who said it? 
Only Mikey. Where are the men we were looking for them, huh? Where are they? Or do we have only boys in this place, huh? No men? Only boys? Where are the men? <laughs> Everyone's dutching, you know, the, the bullets here, you know. <laughs> Therefore, it says, I want the men in every place to do what? To pray, lifting up holy hands. That means we worship as well. Without what? Anger, without disputing, without quarreling, or without doubt in our minds. So in other words, if the men do not take the rightful place like Jesus has taken before the Father to intercede for you and for me, we will not see the first part, which is to what? To live lives that are peaceful and godly. Let me tell you, unfortunately, in this world, and what I'm seeing, the pattern is that the ladies, you know what? They're taking the places that belong to the men because the men are not willing to step up to it. The men do not want to pray. Men do not want to read the Bible to their families. Men do not want to do what God has given us to do, the responsibility to teach our children and our wives the Word of God. So therefore, what happens? The ladies have to step up. They have to read the Bible to the children. They have to do all kinds of things. And the men are watching TV or scratching their bellies and waiting for the ladies to rise up or just kind of relying on them to do the work that has been given to them. What happens when a man begins to pray for their families? Let me tell you, changes begin to take place. A wife or a woman can pray, but the responsibility has begun to have been given to who? The man. The men have been given the authority in the household, not the women, not the ladies, and therefore many families are upside down. Why? Because the men are not stepping up to the plate. Men are not responsible enough to understand that if they do not do it, if they do not take the initiative, then the whole thing has fall, or will fall apart or will simply work or, or, or walk or, or move in a way that is not according to the way God intended it to be. And all of that brings consequences. More conflicts between men and women. More conflict between the children and the parents. Why? Because the men don't want to step up. How many know a few men like that? Everyone's going like, don't ask me, Pastor. <laughs> now, let's read the whole thing in context, okay? Let's keep reading. Now, woman. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves modestly and appropriately and discreetly in proper, proper clothing, with, with, uh, not with elaborately, you know, braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but instead adorned by good deeds, helping others, as improper for women who profess to worship God. A woman must quietly receive instruction with all submissiveness, and do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. But to remain quiet in a congregation for Adam was formed first by God from the earth, then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman who was led astray and fell into sin. But woman will be, will be persevered, uh, preserved, saved through the pain of dangers of the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and wholeness with self-control and discretion. Now, what is it saying here? It's saying that women should not exercise authority over who? Men. I was least talking in this case in a church setting, and we can also take it to a family setting. Should not exercise nor teach men. Now, why is, is it the Bible tells us this? Because men have been given that ministry to do what? to be the ones responsible to teach their families. Now, in this case, he's saying, you know what? Because women were the one who, what? Who sinned at the beginning. God cursed, released, he spoke that because of that, women would bear children with much pain. But also, 
to men for having heard their ladies, what happened? We will have to work hard with sweat and eat the bread with the sweat from our foreheads. We will labor the land and it will give us thorns. So God cursed the women and cursed men because of the sin that came in. Women for having listened to the serpent and men for having heard who? Their wives. Why? Because in this case, Adam did not take responsibility for the actions. He could have said, Lord, yes, it's true, we ate. But he threw it off. It was her. She said it was the serpent. And the serpent said it was the mouse. Just kidding, just kidding. But everyone is flicking off, not trying to accept the responsibility that was given to them. And that is what's happened today. We rather listen to someone else then us as men go directly to God. And if we do not have a prayer life, how can we hear from God? If we do not read the Bible, how can we know what God is saying to us? How can we discern? How can we identify where the problems in our own families lay or where is it that we need to make adjustments so that we can live godly and peaceful lives? Am I making sense? I'm not saying the woman cannot do a job, because believe me, many times they can do it way better than men. They can run a company probably even better than men in some cases. And they might be really well organizers and be able to do so many things. But unfortunately, in some ways, that is not the design that God made for the church, for the family. God established His way, not Reinhardt's way, his way for a family to run. And that is for the men to stand up and to take full responsibility of what happens in their household. Same thing for the church. Is that's being given to the men. But men right now are too busy doing what? Going after their own desires. Going after what they want. The loss of the eyes. The pride of life. They're going after their dreams in some ways. And there's nothing wrong in doing that. But when these dreams, these desires are worldly rather than godly, then the whole family gets its balance and the enemy begins to come in in one way or another. Right? Proverbs 31, 23 talks about how, in this case, the virtuous woman would help her husband and encourage her husband to do what? Let's read. Her husband is known in the city's gates when he sits among the elders of the land. In other words, the husband is able to leave home because he's got a helper at home. He's got someone that can take care of the, in some ways, family affairs, if you want to call it that way. And be able to go to the city gates where the elders of the city would sit there and discuss what? The business of the city. What was happening in the city. They were able to recognize who was coming into the city and who was leaving the city. They were able to see who was bringing what and who was taking away what. In other words, they were guarding the entrance to their city where their families lived. Against what? Against thieves? Against deceivers? Against their enemies? Against all kinds of maybe bad things or diseases or someone that may come with leprosy or whatever, they would stop him at the city gate so that it would not contaminate the entire town. But it was the man who would stand where? At the city gates. Guarding, protecting. Why is this such an important thing? If you understand what a city gate means is that you, if you understand that, you know what, that we live in a, in, a, in a city surrounded by walls, the only way to the city is through the gates. 
So when the enemy would come, the first thing they would do is they would burn down the city gates, they would break loose the doors, they would knock them open and kill any guard that was there, and that is they were able to raid a city and just completely destroy the men that were protecting and taking care of that city, and that's how they would begin to do. The rest was easy because it was just the men, the ladies or the women and the children that were in their homes and it was easy for them to rape, to steal, to, to do whatever they wanted to do because they had taken care of the hardest part which was all the men protecting the entrance to the city. But let me tell you, the enemy doesn't have to do that today because the men are not standing in the gates of their own families in their own cities. They're not protecting. Spiritually speaking, they're not being watchful. They're not discerning who the enemy is. And the enemy can come in a shape, way, or form of even being too complacent, being too lazy, being too indifferent, being greedy, being fearful, whatever it may be, whatever that may be, it comes through the gates. But if the man is not paying attention, it affects the entire family. Discouragement. Fear, doubt, confusion, perversions, any kind of sin. If men are not watchful, the children and the wife pay the price. And you would say, Reinhard, how can I control what my son is watching? How can I control what my son is doing? That's your responsibility. You have to get to know your son, get to know your wife. Ask them, how was your day? What did you do today? Discern what is trying to come into your own family. But because men are not men of prayer, because we are not people that are standing vigilant at the gates of our own families, the enemy has plundered, has come in, and has done what? Has put fear, has put doubt, has put confusion, has even taken away the blessings, whether in some cases even the resources, or even the health and the peace that we may have. Why? Because we don't have words at all to say to our family to bring encouragement, to bring hope, to bring strength, to uplift our wives, our children, to bring protection, to make them feel safe. Because the Word of God is not in our hearts. Am I making sense? So who do you think God is going to speak to make a decision in the household? Who's leading the household? Is it the man or the woman? Well, it should be the man because that's what God has established, right? But sometimes the ladies are the one making and calling the shots because the men don't want to step up to it. God will use our wives to confirm many things. To help us see other angles. To help us see things maybe that may be coming in advance. But the decision will always have to be made by the men. God will give direction to the man, not to the woman. To the man and confirm that direction through the woman. And as men we choose where we steer the car or the direction that we want to go to. You cannot come to me and say, my wife forced me because you decided to move the wheel to that direction. My wife told me, or my wife this, my wife that. No, you cannot say that. You made the choice to listen to your wife rather than to listen to God. Are you connected with God? Are you listening to what God is saying to you? Are you paying attention to what is trying to come into your household and what the enemy is trying to do to raid your city. Are we paying attention to what's happened today? Can we see the tyranny that is taking place? Can we see all the things that are being pushed on us? Can we see all these things happening to us right now here in Canada? But where are the men? Where are the men? 
All the children in the couch watching, you know, soap operas. Hockey night or basketball night or where are the men? You know, we all know the story. Deborah was a tremendous woman. And Deborah was a prophetess. And unfortunately, at that time, men did not want to step up and did not want to take the responsibility to lead. So God allowed her to rise up to put the man to shame. She did a tremendous work. Why? Because she was being led by God. Not because she wanted the position, but God allowed her to rise up. To show us that if men are not willing to rise up, he will use whoever wants to be used. And that is what's happened today. That is what's happened for many years. I don't know if it's globally or maybe in these cultures here in the north where we have now in some ways men always competing with women and women competing with men. Women are always trying to be in some ways like, you know, have equality with men. And again, there's nothing wrong in having equal pay and be able to vote and all these things. But what happens in between in the, in, in, in the family is that we need to respect the line of authority that God has established. And if we do that, everything will work the way that God wants us to be. Why am I touching on this topic? Because men right now need to be vigilant. Men right now need to stand up more than ever. Men right now need to tough it up, to man up, to understand that if you are not standing stern, firm, if you're not standing vigilant, if you are not taking the role to lead your family spiritually, believe me, what is coming will come and hit you like a wave and knock you right down, not only you and your family. If you're not praying every night with your family, let me tell you, your faith is not strong. If you're not reading the Word with your family, you're not giving words of encouragement, you're not bringing hope to your children, to your wife. If you're not reading the Word or knowing the Word, how do you know what is coming if you cannot discern it through God's Word? How are we going to prepare for the things that we're seeing unfold before us if we cannot hear God's voice and make the choices or the changes that we need to make right now to be positioned in a place so that we can be ahead or we can be a blessing or we can be positioned to receive a blessing rather than to be stolen from everything that God has given to us? Am I making sense? Ezekiel 22, 30 to 31 says like this. Ezekiel 22, 30 to 31 says like this. I search for a man. For who? A man. Among them who will build up the wall and stand in the gap before me. Now, who are the ones that have to build the walls? The men. If you know the story of Jeremiah, you will understand this. They took the lead, initiative, to rebuild the walls. I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand the gap before me for the sake of the land that I would not destroy it, but I found no one, not even one. Therefore, 
I have poured my out my in, my indignation on them. I have consumed them with fire of my wrath. I have rapid uh, repaid. So I repaid their way by bringing it upon their own heads, says the Lord God. So in other words, says God is telling us, I looked for a man. I've been looking for a man that will stand in the gap. A man that will say, here I am, Lord, use me any way you want to. I'll do whatever you ask for. I'll stand, I'll pray, I'll intercede. But then Sally, he goes and says, but I have found no one. I haven't found any man willing to do this. And because of that, he will do what? Release his wrath. His indignation, the fire that will consume the sin, our transgression as people. Can you understand and see the spiritual atmosphere here in Canada right now? Can you discern what is happening? Can you understand what we're facing in this moment, in this situation? Where are the men? And I'm not talking about going out and protesting. I'm not saying that. Where are the men? Standing in their households, in their families, here in this church, where are the men? Many are looking for power, but don't want responsibility. Maybe looking, maybe many are looking for a name. But again, they don't want to, you know, have to deal with all the, again, pressures that come. Many are looking to be seen, but the first problem comes, they're the first one to run away. Where are the men? I truly believe that if we don't tough it up right now, if the men do not stand up right now in their households, we will not endure what's coming. If we, as a congregation, do not see our men rise up among us, we will not be able to do all that God wants us to do. We need the men to step up. We need the men to rise up. We need the men to be and have the initiative to do God's work, to teach others. And that is not to say that we don't need the women. No, yes, we need the women just as much. But men have been given the responsibility. And if the men don't take it, believe me, God's going to allow the women to rise. And we are going to be accountable for that. Again, I want you to make sure that I'm very clear on this. I'm not saying women are not important. I'm not saying women are not capable. I'm not saying women cannot do this. No, they're just as capable as anyone else, if not more in many ways. They can multitask like no other. Men can do that. Women can. But God designed was for the men to lead, to be the strong one, to be that shield, to be the one watching taking care at the city gates day and night, night and day, making sure that no sickness, no evil, no thief, nothing would come through those city gates to protect the town that he lived in and his family inside that town. Can you imagine if we lived in a community if all of us had a little piece of land over here and everyone ever had our houses and we were like a little village, a little, little community, how would you be responding or, or living your life? Hey, where's Mike? I don't know. I, I haven't seen him in days. I think he's playing video games. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong playing video games because I play video games with my children too. Hey, where's Chris? I don't know. I haven't seen him in weeks. What's he doing? I don't know. 
And who's standing at the gates then? Who's taking care? I think I saw Yerli and Vanessa over there because the men don't want to... They're too busy doing other things. They're baking. I think I saw Reiner with an apron somewhere over there. And there's nothing wrong with washing dishes. I wash the dishes in my house. But where are the men? Ladies, let the man rise. Encourage them to rise. Motivate them to rise. To take their place and support them in the vision that God has given to them. Don't fight the vision. Don't go against the vision. Work together. You are a team. And now more than ever, we need to come together as families, as a church. And it starts by men getting up in the morning, at noon, at night, and praying. Are you taking time to pray? Are you praying for your wife, for your children? Are you praying for your city? Are you praying for your nation? Jesus was a man of prayer. Moses was a man of prayer. All these great men of God was, there were men and women of prayer. God wants you to be a man of prayer. God wants you to be a man of God. God wants you to be light, to be the salt of this earth as well. God wants you to stand at the city gates, to be watchful, to protect what has been given to you. God wants you to rise up He doesn't want to force you to do anything you don't want to do. So where are the men? Hmm? By now we should be having 20 home groups. You know, it's easy to grab the Bible and to say, you know what, let's go through John 3 today. Let's talk about it. I don't understand it, but let's talk about it. Let's learn together. The initiative has to come from the man. Hey, why don't we sing a couple of songs tonight? No, I don't want to, Daddy. I don't want to because I got to watch my show on TV. The initiative will come from the man. We have to do it, guys. We have to do it. The men have to rise up. One day, and I'm telling you right now, we will not be able to get together like this. And you already experienced it, and we're about to enter into another lockdown. Regardless of what happens, whether they lock us down again or not, who is responsible for your family? Hmm? The men. The men say... Amen. Huh? The men say? Amen. Oh, That's like amen, amen, amen. <laughs> amen. Come on. That's what's amen, right? Amen. Don't let it be that God's saying, I was looking for a man, but I couldn't find any among I go church. I was looking for the man. But I couldn't find them in the city because they're too busy doing other things. I was looking for the man to see who would stand in the gap and be willing to build these walls. But 
Only the women were available. Only the women were willing. Because if men were too coward or too lazy or too self-centered to think about others and to think about maybe the future or what God has entrusted us with, our families, our children, this congregation, So where are those men? Where are those that will say, Lord, here I am, send me. I'll start in my own household. Where are those that will say, hey, I want to start something. I want to step up. I want to serve. I want to help my neighbor. Where are those that will say, you know what? I want to teach. I want to pray. You know that every day, I know many of you get up and they're praying early, but every day I get up at 6 or 5 o'clock. God wakes me up at 3. I pray at 3. I get up at 6, 5 o'clock, do some things. Then from 7 to 8, I'm praying and we're praying for you. A group of people come, Corey knows this, five or six of us, always there for now eight, nine months, nonstop. And then at noon, we have another 15 praying for what? For our city, for our nation, for you, for me, for my family, for your family. And I thank God because of this wall of protection that has been built around this church everyone has jobs everyone has provision everyone is still alive in fact some of you guys are more blessed now than you were eight nine months ago you have new children you got a race maybe in your pay you work less and you get paid maybe the same or you've had food when a lot of people don't have food on their tables right now. What do you think is causing this? Is it your own decisions? No, it's not your own decisions. It's the grace of God. But the walls are up. The prayer has gone on for nine months now nonstop. And it will continue to go. Because we are at the city gates doing what? Praying and seeing who is trying to come in to take away what? Our joy, our peace, our health, our finances, our children. We are there, yes, some of us tired. Sometimes, yes, the strength leaves the body. But the Holy Spirit gives us the power to continue. Because we understand the necessity and the need and the importance to be what? To be at the city gates watching what is happening. Think about this. At the city gates, all the things were discussed. The business, the problems. If I do, the prophetic insight is not to tell you the news, but rather to tell you this is trying to come into our city. What will you do about it? Are you going to pray? Or are you going to let it come in? Where are the men? Hmm? Where are the men? Now you may say to me, Oh, I've tried and I've tried and my man doesn't want to do anything. Well, they keep praying for him because one day, believe me, God's going to touch him. And he's going to be on fire for God. And you're going to be complaining that he hasn't spent enough time with you. Or you may say, Ryan, right I'm a single mother or I'm not married. Or, well, you have less responsibility when it comes to other people. But you still have the same responsibility to take over and to watch for what has been given to you. Close your eyes. Let's pray. 
I want to encourage you to step up. Step up. Take responsibility. The one that God wants you to have. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for anyone but God. Because God will reward you. And you will see how God will use you to transform your family. Because it is in the rightful order that God wants it to be. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you so much. We ask, of oh God, that your Holy Spirit will bring conviction of sin to our hearts, to all of us, but especially the man, Lord God. Especially us as men for not doing and not wanting to step up to what you are called us to be, which is to lead, which is to be the head, which is to be a, someone that makes a way for our families. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you give us strength as men to push through all the obstacles, all the lies, all the discouragement, all the things that we hear from the world, Lord God, to push through, Lord God, to make a way so that light can come in into our families. So that hope can be in the tip of our tongues to those that are walking in darkness or that are hopelessness. In the name of Jesus, Father, I pray that the man, Lord God, would understand this in their spirit. That we're not just here to make money, we're not just here to pass by, we're not just here to reproduce, but to lead. To lead others to you, to lead others to righteousness. To lead others to the truth. To lead others by example. To lead others, oh God. In the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, bring conviction of sin. Do not let us stay still. Put that hunger to seek you, to praise you, to worship you, to hear your voice, and to communicate that wisdom, and to be diligent and intentional, Lord God, in bringing it to our families. The manna that comes from heaven, Lord God, that we may be able to pass it on. Because our families are dependent on us. Our children, our future is dependent on men, men rising up. In the name of Jesus, Father, I pray for the women as well. I pray for wisdom. That you may give them wisdom on knowing how to encourage their husbands. How to work with their husbands. How to build together with their husbands. That they may be sensitive to the needs. They may be sensitive to even the flaws, the weaknesses. And rather, Lord God, expose and criticize. To cover and rebuild. In the name of Jesus, Father, help us be one as couples, as families. Let us be one, Lord God, as a church. Let us be one with you, Father. Let us be one with Jesus. Let us be one with one another, just like you are with your own Father, Lord God. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray, Lord God, I pray that you may unite us to equip us for this time and to face whatever comes together, Lord God, to protect what you've given to us and to bring glory to your name, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Let's give glory to the Lord.
You know, already we've been talking in council to make a beaning for the men, to wake up and shake up the men. But just like anything, if there is no response, if there's no um, action, then things cannot happen. Someone has to take the responsibility. Someone has to take it to heart. Someone has to have initiatives. Will they come from you? Why are you waiting for me, Mike, and Nick to do everything for you? Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you, Lord God, for your word, and we thank you for every family that is here. Father, I want to release a blessing tonight, Lord God. Father, I speak blessings on everyone tonight here. I speak, Lord God, strength and hope. I speak joy, Lord God, for those that have lost their joy. I speak, Lord God, A mantle, Lord God. A mantle and an oil, Lord God, that will come to heal the hearts of many. To protect, Lord God. To cover, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, Father, let us rise up. Let us bring glory to your name. That's what the church is here for. To bring glory to your name. To stand up and to push the devil back. And to remind the devil that Jesus Christ has defeated him along with all his principalities and all his demons and that his faith has already been determined in the lake of fire and that we will be with you forever and ever in Jesus name we pray amen and amen God bless you all thank you Jesus Like Mike said, we will continue, okay, until it becomes illegal to get together. And even if it becomes illegal, we will find ways to make it legal. <laughs> Before I close up, I just want to tell you this. We're trying to build an app for the phones so that we can stay connected to this app. Informed, disciples, have mentors, all kinds of things. We've been working on this for a couple of months now, and we're very close in finishing it. Please keep it in your prayers, because we need wisdom to make it happen and foresee all the things that may come our ways, so that we can be ahead of the game. And still allow God to mobilize us the way that he chooses to do. Amen. God bless you all.